In your bulletins, you may have noticed an announcement about an upcoming membership class cycle that we're getting ready to start sometime this fall. That's the plan anyway, to to offer that this fall. Um, I'm struggling to find uh, an open window of three straight weeks where I'm available to do it, Um, but uh, don't don't worry, I'm going to find a time. Uh, So those of you who are interested, you know, I will let you know when, when I can, when that's going to be. But one of the things that we, that we emphasize in membership class, um, for those of you who haven't had it yet, um, and as a reminder to those of you who have had the membership class here before, one of the things that we emphasize, and it's something that I hope you detect when you come in here on a Sunday morning to worship with us, is that we are, without apology, a Bible-believing church. And it's a shame to even have to, to clarify that today, um, as if there is such a thing as a church that doesn't believe in the Bible, but, in, but unfortunately that's the day in which we live, um, that you have to tell people that you are a, one of those types of churches, the type that actually believes the Bible, um, and not just as a church, but as a whole denomination. Uh, the Evangelical Methodist Church stands firmly in its conviction in the inspiration, the inerrancy, the authority, and the relevancy of the Scriptures. That is, that the Bible is inspired by God. That it is true in everything that it affirms from cover to cover. That it is the sole authority for every area of life. And that despite all of our modern wisdom, it is still very much relevant today. It matters today. We don't just believe that the Bible contains the word of God. We affirm that the Bible is the word of God. And we at this church want to know truth. Therefore, we strive to be faithful in teaching and preaching and living out what the Bible actually says. And that word actually is key. We want to know what the Bible actually says about things, not what we think the Bible says about things or what other people tell us the Bible says about things. We want to know what the scriptures actually have to say. And sometimes even Christians Uh, present company included. I'm not excluded from this, uh, what might feel like an accusation. It's not. It's just uh, being objective here. Even we at times can be guilty of believing or even repeating things that are actually misconceptions of what the Bible actually has to say. You might be thinking, well, like what, Pastor Sean? Well, let me give you some examples. Um, How about the phrase, God helps those who help themselves? Can someone find the chapter and verse for that? Um, you can't find it in the scriptures. You, uh, in fact, it was a term, a phrase coined by uh, Benjamin Franklin. Not one of the inspired writers of the scriptures, I'm afraid. How about this one? Um, cleanliness is next to godliness. Once again, um, I'm afraid we have to ascribe that one to actually the founder of Methodism, John Wesley himself. That was a, a phrase from one of his sermons that he used. But people often, they hear that phrase, they think it's from the Bible, they, they quote it as if it's from the Bible, and they repeat that as if it's from the Bible. Um, wh- what about this one? This too shall pass. That's actually an old Persian proverb. That has, that's not you can't find that as a, an, ex, an exact quote from the scriptures. And, and you could go on and on and on with, with phrases like this or ideas like this that people um, parrot as if that's something that, that comes straight from the word of God. And some of these misconceptions, um, they are close to what the scriptures actually say. That's why it's so easy to make the mistake. Um, but others are not so close. You know, the, the phrase, this too shall pass, you know, that's actually really close to biblical truth. Right, Because it's, it's communicating this idea that, that even though our circumstances are hard, there's hope for the future. That these, the, the hardships we face today, they don't last forever. That there will come a time when God will, will provide ultimate healing. There's a time where God will give ultimate renewal. That God will indeed wipe away every tear. So you can comfort someone with biblical truth, even though it's a phrase that's not exactly found in the Bible as we tend to say it to one another. But then there's the other end of the spectrum where, like the first one I mentioned, where it says God helps those who help themselves. I actually find that to be quite unbiblical. Um, It's this idea that, you know, God will come along your side as long as you're doing your part to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. And I tend to to see God operating in the scriptures, not for those who are self-reliant or self-sufficient or those who who are taking care of themselves and providing for themselves. God is coming alongside of those who in their desperation and in their need and in their dependence upon him, cry out to him. Who say, God, I cannot do this on my own. 
I need you to come alongside of me. I need you to fill me. I need you to provide for me. I need you to be what I cannot be for myself. That's who God is seeing coming alongside of in the scriptures. But there's another one, another common misconception that I want to address this morning um, that actually comes from the passage where we're going to be focusing on today. And I want to mention it, not because it's a pet peeve. This isn't Pastor Sean who has a beef about something. I'm not going to be stepping onto a soapbox here. Um, that's not my heart at all. The only reason why I'm even, I'm even addressing it this morning is because it has bearing on how we actually understand the text that we're going to focus on here in just a few moments. And not just the text, but on Luke's structuring of the book of Acts as a whole. So it, it matters in how we understand the Bible that we get this particular misconception right. Um, so let me ask you this question. Um, you don't, don't feel like you have to answer this out loud. I just want you to think, and this is a rhetorical question. Um, when did Saul become Paul? When did Saul become Paul? Now people almost universally point to what, his conversion experience, right? His, his journey down the Damascus Road and the resurrected, glorified Jesus appears to him in blinding light. And it's there in Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. And they'll say, this is when Saul became Paul. Um, but that is actually quite incorrect. <laughs> and I hope no one gets upset about that. It's just the reality. It is not the case. Um, it is true that Saul's Damascus Road experience was a life-changing experience. Um, but I'm afraid it was not a name-changing experience. Okay? It was a life-changing experience. It was not a name-changing experience. And you have to look no further than the scriptures themselves. Um, Jesus, in verse 4 of chapter 9, what does he call him? He calls him Saul. He addresses him as Saul multiple times. Saul, Saul. Later on in our, in our passage we're going to read here in a moment, um, he will tell Ananias, there's a man named Saul. Go see Saul. In fact, chapter 9, if we continue through chapter 9, we'll see his name multiple, I think at least eight more times throughout the chapter where he is called Saul. You never hear the name Paul in chapter 9. Um, you'll hear Saul all the way up until Luke changes to his focus to Peter. In fact, we don't hear the name Paul until chapter 13. And even then, Luke is just simply saying, there in verse 9, Saul, who was also called Paul. Meaning simply he, he had a Hebrew name and he had a, a Roman name. He was a Roman citizen. And I know that's really, that sounds really unimpressive, right? That's not nearly as exciting as, you know, when Jesus changes uh, Simon's name to Peter, Right, this like monumental moment where Jesus is making a statement about you know, the, the role of the apostle and the apostles in being, being the church and um, his confession being the foundation upon which Christ will build what you see around you here today. Um, this monumental moment in Peter's life and in the life of the church and in the unfolding of the gospel. It's, it's this incredible moment. And we dump that idea into chapter 9 of Acts as if the same thing is happening there when in fact... Um, it's not. That's not what the scriptures actually say. Um, so, I still want to know, why does Luke change the name at all? Why in chapter 13 does he tell us that Saul was also called Paul? And then from that point on, start talking about him as Paul. And if he's going to, why didn't he just stick with one name to start with? Why does he change it in the other place? That's the thing that I'm interested in this morning, and I think the answer goes back to something we've been pointing out for the last several weeks, and it has to do with the larger point that Luke is making in the overall construction of Acts as a whole. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 8, the final words of Jesus to his church is, you will be what? You will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem? In Judea? In Samaria? And to the ends of the earth? And we've seen Luke, from that point on, show us that exact sequence of expansion of the, of the church. So in chapters 2 through 7, you have uh, the church being Christ's witness in Jerusalem and Judea, from Peter to Stephen. This is all taking place in Jerusalem and Judea. But then, by the persecution of Saul, the church expands. And suddenly in chapter 8, you have Philip in Samaria. And now, in chapter 9, you'll see the church begin its movement to the ends of the earth, beginning with the conversion of Saul. 
who, Paul, who Luke does not call Paul until he launches out on his first missionary journey. So Luke is using the, the name of Saul slash Paul to help us understand the overall construction of his letter, that the, the church is fulfilling the commands of Jesus to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. So um, my hope then with this was really an extended introduction is to, yes, clarify a common misconception. Um, let's just, let's stop saying chapter nine is when Saul became Paul. Um, yes, it is to you know, reinforce the importance of a Bible-believing church actually listening to what the Bible has to actually say. Um, but thirdly, this introduction is meant to give us a little bit of context for what is happening here in chapter nine. W- what is Luke beginning to unveil to us? It's this movement from Jerusalem in Judea, Samaria, and then now with this call upon Saul's life to, to move to the ends of the earth. All right, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the account immediately following Saul's conversion there in chapter 9. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, if you grab the guest Bible, we're on page 882, and we're going to begin in verse 10. Um, verse 9 has just indicated to us that uh, after his encounter with Jesus, Saul is blinded, he's in Damascus, and, he, and three days have passed, and he hasn't eaten or, or drank a thing. Okay, so that's the context here up into verse 10. Let's look at verse 10 together down through verse 19. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. We'll stop right there in the middle of verse 19. So I want to spend um, our time here that we have left together um, considering the change that occurred to all of Saul's relationships after his conversion. So we'll look at his relationship to God, his relationship to the church, and his relationship, finally, to the Jews. Now, chapter 9 began with Luke telling us that, in verse 1, Saul was, quote, uttering threats with every breath as a result of his hatred of Jesus and those who followed Jesus. He's uttering threats with every breath. He's eager to kill the Lord's believers, we're told. But then when we get to verses 9 and verse 11, after his conversion experience, he's found doing what? He's fasting and he's praying. So uttering threats, fasting and praying. Now, as a Pharisee, this would not have been the first time that Saul ever fasted and prayed. In fact, uh, it was most likely uh, twice a week that he would have been fasting and praying. This was the common thing for a Pharisee to to do there in the first century. Um, So even though it wasn't his first time fasting and praying, it was his first time fasting and praying as a result of his newfound reconciliation to God through the work of Christ. And and friends, that makes all the difference in the world. You can take people who are striving really hard to be religious, people who who are really convinced they're spiritual, people who think that they're they're being good people or doing things that God, whoever he is out there, would be pleased with, people who have notions or ideas of, of what God is like and what it's like to be a believer or a follower of some kind. But the difference between a religion about God and a relationship with God is Jesus Christ. 
He is the difference between something that is dead, something that is man-made, something that is from the, the, the world up in our efforts, and something that is from heaven down, something that is life-giving, something that is eternal, something that is real. Jesus makes sinners right with the Father. And the Christian alone enjoys immediate access to God. Not the casual spiritual person, not the nominal believer, the word nominal meaning, of course, by name only. There's a lot of people out there who will who style themselves as believers or style themselves as Christians, who will say that they agree, at least intellectually, with certain ideas or certain concepts about God, and yet there's no real living faith that defines their lives. It's just speech. It's just, it's just categories. It's, just, it's nominalism. It's name only. And Jesus does not make the name only person right with the Father. Jesus makes right with the Father those who through living faith in his person and in his work and by the power of the Holy Spirit are born again as God's own sons and daughters by grace. Those are the ones that are made right with God. Those are the ones who enter into a life-giving relationship with the Lord. Jesus tells Ananias, I love there in verse 11, I don't know if, you, if it stood out to you when I read it a moment ago. It jumped off the page at me this week as I was diving into my study. Jesus tells Ananias in this vision, Saul is praying to me right now. Isn't that fascinating? That even as Saul is praying to Jesus, Jesus is having a conversation with Ananias. Jesus is the master multitasker. <laughs> I, I would last two seconds in his role. I, I'm, I have a wonderful family, three wonderful kids, three very verbose children. They have many things to say. And when we're traveling together, I'm hearing all the things at once. And it's like a tag team. Like, I'm done. And tag, you're it. And then there's, and there's, I just get to this point where like, I love all of you, but I need like two seconds. Two seconds where no one says anything. I just need a moment to like make sense of all that's happening. And it's only fair because my mom, uh, the, the queen mother herself is back there this morning again. The candake of the Scribner household. Um, for those of you last week who weren't here last week, that's a joke from last week. So you can listen to last week's sermon and then you can laugh at how funny it was that I said it again today. Um, my mom would tell me my entire, well, my entire life, when you were young, you never stopped talking. And I would just say, Sean, just give me five minutes of you not talking. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that. And I guess uh, there's something like karma happening. I'm getting it now three times over with my, with my kids, which is wonderful. But I will be a terrible Jesus. I cannot multitask. I cannot listen to one need and be having a conversation about another all at once. But Jesus is, it's nothing for him. It's, it's effortless for him. Ananias, I have something to tell you. And as I'm telling you this, I'm listening to the cries of Saul, the prayers of Saul, and in, in his marvelous wisdom, in, in his love, he's, he's tying all of these things together, and he's meeting needs, and Luke is giving us a, a real-time insight into this incredible, new, life-giving relationship that Saul has with God, that as he's praying to Jesus, accessing God through Jesus. God is hearing his prayers. God is working. God is, is willing marvelous things for his life. God is doing something that, that, that only he can do in Saul's life. Saul may not have been able to see it yet, pun intended, but even as he prayed, Jesus was at work in his life as he always is, even now. As I'm talking and you're listening, Jesus is at work in each of your lives. He's at work in other people's lives, effortlessly, willing good things for you, preparing significant moments and encounters for you. Even while Saul was in a, an, a, a, an active posture of hostility towards God, even when he was resisting God and fighting against God, and we know that's the exact language he himself will use later in his testimony in Acts 26. He'll say, I heard a voice saying to me on this day in Acts chapter 9, Saul, why are, you, why are you persecuting me? It's useless for you to fight against my will. Saul had been fighting against the will of God. And even in his fighting against the will of God, God was at work. God was doing something. 
And in fact, the more he fought against the will of God, the more the will of God advanced in his life and in the world. The the more Saul persecuted the church, the, the greater the church's expansion became. But Jesus is saying that even in Saul's resistance, God was at work in the world, in the church, and even in his life to carry out his purposes for Saul to appoint him, 26, 16, as his witness and as his servant. And the point of that is this. The salvation of a human soul never begins in the human will. It begins, rather, in the mind and in the heart of God. He works. He calls. He's the one who appoints to reconcile sinners back to God to incorporate them into his work in the world. And you're going to be assured that he's doing the same thing in all of our lives, to bring us in the saving relationship with himself, to incorporate us into his work in the world. The one formerly kicking against the goads is now, at this point, no longer pushing back. And so I wonder for you you and for me, have you been resisting the will of God in your life? The will of God, which is first and foremost, for you to be saved, for you to be conformed into the likeness of Christ, for you to be a witness to Jesus in your world? Have you been resisting the ongoing work of God? Well, today is a day where you can stop resisting, where you can surrender to his will. What about Saul's relationship to the church? We're looking again at the relationships. We've talked about his relationship to God that is... It's, that has changed because of Jesus. What about his relationship to the church? Well, what was his relationship to the church? Right? Again, back in verse 1, what had he been doing? Why was he going to Damascus in the first place? Oh, he's looking for believers that he can lay his hands on them, that he can drag them out of their homes, that he can commit them to prison, have them put to death. He's uttering threats with every breath, we're told. He wants to see everyone in, that belongs to Jesus. Luke says, killed. It's a murderous intent. It's no wonder that Ananias was a little taken aback there at Jesus' command. You saw it a second ago. And it's reinforced again later in chapter 9, verse 26, when Saul eventually makes it to Jerusalem. None of the believers would come and greet him. Why? Because they were scared of him, because last time he was around. I mean, he left Jerusalem, you know, vowing to come back, presumably. Once I'm done in Damascus, I'm coming back here, and I'm going to come after you next. And here he's returned. So what are they? Naturally, they're, they don't believe it. They think it's a, a they think it's a story. It's not true. He didn't become a Christian. We're not going. We're not going to fall for that. So we understand Ananias's you know, reluctance or hesitation or I don't know what was in his heart. He just his lack of understanding. He's yielded to Jesus, but he doesn't fully understand what it all means. And um, and yet, like Philip, who we saw last week, his obedience to God meant taking great risk upon himself. And he, like Philip, answers in language that's almost identical to Isaiah's language. When, he, when the Lord says, Ananias, he says, I'm here. Here am I. Here in a couple weeks, you're going to be challenged during our missions conference to hear, to hear the, vo- the voice of God calling out. And you'll be challenged to respond as Isaiah did, as Ananias did. No wonder William Barclay called him one of the forgotten heroes of the Christian church. We forget about Ananias, and we forget about the role he played. It's a small one, but it it wasn't insignificant. But as amazing as his response is to Jesus, I love even more what Jesus calls him to do. And it feels a lot like um, what Peter and John had to do back in the last chapter. Remember, they went to Samaria because uh, this strange phenomenon had happened. They'd been baptized, uh, but the Holy Spirit hadn't come. And so it was through the laying on of hands that God um, not only was, was, was uh, putting his seal of reconciliation upon the Samaritans and God, but upon the Samaritans and the Jews. It was through this physical touch that he was bringing people together. And we see the same kind of thing happening here uh, in chapter 9 as Jesus tells Ananias to go and find Saul and put your hands on him. This one, we're told back in verse 3, going from house to house, laying his hands on believers. With what goal in mind? 
we said it a moment ago, to, to snatch them out, to put them in prison, to put them to death. This same one, Ananias is told, you go and put your hands on him. For what end? Oh, not to kill, but to affirm. To restore. To, to heal. What a beautiful picture of how Jesus uses people, you and me, to reinforce the truth of his, of his love. What a beautiful picture of how Jesus not only reconciles us to God, but he reconciles us to one another. Saul may not have been able to see Ananias' face, but he could, he could feel his touch, couldn't he? Imagine that in your blindness. Someone coming and laying their, their hand upon you. That I wonder how heightened his sense of touch was in his blindness. Because this is one of the things I understand about losing a sense, it heightens the others. If you can no longer see, then suddenly you can hear better, right? You can probably smell better. You can, and I imagine there's something transforming about the physical touch of, of a person and, and what he heard him say. What were probably the first words from a, from a believer, at least that we have recorded in the scriptures, the first words out of a believer's mouth as he lays the one that just three days prior, Saul would have loved to have laid his hands on Ananias. And now Ananias is laying his hands on Saul and he says, my brother, my brother, how would that have changed his life? How would that have affirmed him as, as one loved of God whose life has been changed by Jesus, who is being welcomed into the community of faith? The first words are not, hey, you. <laughs> hey, guy. Hey, you know, person that I was told to come and do this for. No, brother. Words of familial, familial welcome. It is in the body of Christ where people experience physically, tangibly, with the senses, the everlasting love of God. Face to face, person to person, heart to heart. The one who had been taking life was now receiving and entering into life. God uses people. We said last week he uses people to share the good news. But here this week, God uses people to welcome others into his family. And so the challenge for you and for me at this point is, how, are, how is the Lord wanting to use you to welcome others into the family of God? to extend a hand of greeting, a hand of, of affir an affirming touch, a touch of a voice of life, of welcome, of kinship. Are you just passing in to church and out, or are you diving in and, and giving of yourself to play a part in making this truly a, a, a local physical expression of the, the universal, invisible church of God. How is he wanting to use you for that? And finally, let's look at Saul's new relationship to the Jews. <laughs> verse 19, if we were to, I stopped in the middle of verse 19 in our reading a moment ago. If I had continued on reading down through um, verses 20, 22, uh, 24 especially, if we had kept on reading, we would have seen that um, immediately after his encounter with Ananias, Saul remains in Damascus, and he immediately begins to preach about Jesus. And where does he go first? He goes, like he does in his missionary journeys, he goes first to the synagogues, the, the place of worship for the Jew. He goes there, he begins talking about Jesus. In verses 20 and 21, we're told how the Jews who were listening to him were amazed, and they were confounded. Now, were they amazed by the gospel, or were they amazed at a former Pharisee now talking about Jesus? I think it was the latter. 
And I think that because uh, in their amazement, we're told that they eventually, verse 23, um, those who were formerly his brothers are now trying to kill him. Didn't take very long, did it, to get from verse 19 to verse 23. But there is a, an amount of time embedded in there that Luke doesn't indicate for us fully that I think is worth looking at for just a moment. How, how many days elapsed between verses 22 and 23? Verse 22 says, um, Saul's preaching became more and more powerful in the Jews in Damascus. Damascus couldn't review his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, verse 23, what was the while? In the, in the Greek, it says after many days. But how many days? Well, to answer that, we have to flip over to Galatians chapter 1. And I promise you there's a point to this. So don't, don't let me lose you here if, as we're leaving Acts for just a moment. In Galatians chapter 1, as Paul is writing this letter, he indicates for us how much time elapsed between his conversion and uh, verse 23, where the Jews in Damascus plot to kill him. Uh, verse 13, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. And here's the point we made a moment ago about how God works. He's working in our lives before we even know it. Even before I was born, verse 15, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him, chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. That's later on in chapter 9. Instead, I went away into Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. Then, here's the answer, verse 18, Three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at the time was James, the Lord's brother. I declare before God that what I am writing to you is not a lie. So Paul is in Damascus. He's ministering in Damascus. He leaves Damascus for Arabia, not to consult with a human being, he says, literally not to consult with flesh and blood, not to receive orders from the apostles in Jerusalem. No, he went there to receive teaching directly from Jesus himself. He says it in Galatians 1, 11 and 12. I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. Verse 12, I received my message from no human source and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. This, it's the mystery, he tells us in Ephesians 3, that was made known to him by revelation. And the reason is, this is worth mentioning and I know verses 22 and 23 weren't even part of the, the scripture text for the sermon, but it's worth taking a moment as we're considering his changed relationship to the Jews, what happened in this period of time. There's something to be said about the supernatural empowerment for ministry by those or for those called of God. There's something to be said about that, that God himself fills you with his spirit, and that is your power for witness. Without a doubt, we have to emphasize that. But there's also something to be said about the careful preparation for ministry that comes through study and prayer and experience, and most importantly, by a deepening intimacy with Jesus. As Saul was beginning or about to experience his newfound, changed relationship with the Jews, he needed grounding. <laughs> He needed deepening. He needed a strengthening in both his understanding of the word and in his walk with the Lord. Jesus says to Ananias in our text that he must show Saul how much he will suffer. The call to follow Jesus, to be his witness in the world, will inevitably involve suffering and Jesus is going to call him, he's going to appoint him, he's going to send him, but first he's going to prepare him. He needed grounding. He needed preparation. And the same, friends, is true for us, for us all. No one in here is a Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> he, is, he is unique in, in the scriptures 
some think in the history of mankind, and it's not to place him on some high pedestal. In fact, uh, even his name change signifies his diminished sense of his own self-importance. It's not to elevate him to some superhuman status, but it's just to rightfully acknowledge this was a special person commissioned and appointed and sent by God and used by God. And if he needed to deepen his walk with Jesus, if he needed to consecrate himself to study and preparation and uh, to, to discipleship before he fulfilled the Lord's call upon his life, how much more do you and I need to do the same thing? Before you and I are sent, we are called, yes, to salvation. Yes, to one another, to the fellowship of God's people. But we are also called to become disciples, to be discipled before we can make disciples. And make disciples, he did. In verse 25, as the Jews are pressing in to, to, to seize their former brother, to put him to death, we're told that Saul's own disciples, that is the people he had been investing in, the Lord invested into him, he was investing into others. That, that, that beautiful picture of discipleship, you are, you are receiving, you are giving. That's, that's, the, that's every Christian life. You're receiving from somebody, the Lord is pouring himself into you through his word, through, through your walk with him, through the ministry of others, and then you are pouring out into someone else. And as that is happening in his life, we're told it's his disciples who save his life, who lower him down through, by a basket through a window to escape uh, the Jews that are trying to kill him. Listen, uh, you and I absolutely need the fellowship of God's people. We have to have that kind of community of faith Yes, to pour into us and for us to pour into, but we need one another that we can grow together, that we can minister together, that we, like Saul in his, in his community of faith, that we can have each other's backs, that we can meet each other's needs, that we can be there for one another when the going gets tough. And so, uh, church and everyone else, because there may be some here this morning who haven't come to Christ in faith, in saving faith. To you all, let me ask you these questions. First, are you reconciled to God through the person and work, through the blood of Jesus Christ? Are you saved by grace through faith? Have you been born again by a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit? Can you say with honesty, with integrity, with your lips, and with your deeds, that Jesus is both Savior and Lord of your life. Secondly, have you entered deeply into the fellowship of God's people? Are you living the Christian life on the margins of the church? Or have you done your part to be intentional to go, to go deeper, to immerse yourself into the life of the body of Christ. Your brothers and your sisters who are there to affirm you. And I know churches, there's a lot of people in here who have been damaged by churches. I get that. I wish I could say, just like I can't say every church is a Bible-believing Bible church, I, can, I also can't say that every church is a loving family church. And there are a lot of you who, are, who may be here this morning against your will, Maybe all of you, I don't know. Maybe all of you are here against your will, I don't know. Um, but there may be a lot of you here who, are, who, are, who bring great pain, not from Jesus, but from people claiming to belong to Jesus. Don't let that prevent you from entering into the, the beauty of, of life in the body of Christ. And if you want to know what that really looks like, here in a few moments when we're done, just watch what happens up here in the front as people come to love on this family. And you'll see how good it is to be a part of the family of God. Have you found your Christian family that you can immerse yourself into, pour yourself into, and be poured into by them, that you can join together in mission to the world, that you can be all in for Jesus together with, and thirdly, are you ready to go out? To face 
a hostile world. You don't, last week we said he doesn't send you aimlessly. He doesn't send you empty-handed. He doesn't send you without purpose. Um, and, and the same is still true today. But don't be mistaken. It is a hostile world. And just as Saul came out of his time of, of growth and grounding and equipping, the first thing he faced coming out of that was people that once had his back are now ready to stab his back. And that's a lot of your testimonies. People that once thought you thought were, you were friends, but because of your commitment to Jesus, they have, they have stabbed you in the back. And there's others who would love to seize you and silence you. Are you ready to go face that? A world that is as desperately in need of the gospel as it is in active hostility to the gospel. I hope you are, because that's what our calling is. That's our commission. That's why we're having a missions conference in two weeks. It's not so we can feel good about ourselves because we spent X number of dollars supporting other people to do the ministry. It's so that we can re remember God's vision for his world. That it's, it's not about us. It's not about our comforts. It's not about our preferences. It is about his call to be his witnesses. For us to go out and face a world that does not want Jesus, but needs him <laughs> desperately. Today, friends, is the day to be made right with God. Today is the day to immerse yourself completely into the local church. And today is the day for us all to say, in the words of Isaiah, in the words of Ananias, no matter what it costs my life, here am I. Send me. Here am I. I am yours. Jesus, I'm yours. Use me however you see fit to do your work that only you can do. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the forgotten heroes of the Bible. <laughs> heroes like Ananias who only get a, a handful of, of verses. He got even fewer than Philip got. And yet we can see that God uses, he doesn't just use the Saul's to change the world. These exceptional people. He uses ordinary people. People like us. People like me. As hard as that is for me to believe. With God, all things are possible. And so, Lord, we invite you to come and to equip and to fill, to, to give clarity to each of us what your will is for our lives. Yes, first, to, to know you in a saving way. Yes, to be conformed into your image and likeness, to become holy as you are holy. This is your will, our holiness. But even the specifics of your, of your plan for our lives, where do you want me to go? How do you, what do I, what do you want me to say? What do I need to become for somebody? That's, that was, that was Paul's testimony, that he became all things to all people. If he had, if it meant changing his name, he would change his name. If it meant being a Jew for the Jews, being under the law, he would do that. If it meant being out of the law for the Gentile, he would do that. He would do nothing that would become a, a, a barrier to someone coming to Jesus, but he would be all things to all people. Lord, may that be our heart's cry. That, that we would be whatever you call us to be, that someone else might, might come to know you in a saving way. So Lord, speak to each of our hearts, even now as I'm praying. Holy Spirit, come and give clarity, give direction. You can bring application that I could never dream of giving. You hear our prayers. You are the one who's working. You're the one who has plans and thoughts that are so much greater than our own. So Lord, come and reveal to us as we leave this beautiful space of worship, to go out into the world. Lord, guide every step and lead us to, to every encounter that you have in mind and, and help us to boldly and, and courageously and clearly with truth and in love share the gospel with the world around us. For your glory and for your sake alone, these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.